about my 15 year in the industry. And it'll be a bit different from, uh, I guess, the other presentation you saw since the beginning of Game Lab. So what are we going to do? I'm going to go game by game, explaining a little bit what I learned, my conception of the medium that I call video games, and then a little bit of my tricks of the trade, but not everything. I keep some secret, okay? We're we can have a beer, uh, or not a beer because I don't drink beer anymore, but uh, a drink afterwards and then I'll say everything. A little bit what I foresee for the future, a little bit, I'll try. And I'll answer some of your questions. Uh, at first I wanted to have an interactive talk with you, so if you had any question, you could you know, grab a mic and ask me a question while I talk. But since we're really short on time, I don't think it'll be possible to do it. But at the end, if I'm quick, maybe we'll have time to talk, okay? So before we start, uh, this talk was first presented in French for students in a school in uh, Angoulême, France. Then I did it in my own high school, which was really, really special. Uh, I went back to my school after 20 years and then I was like, oh, the star is coming back. And I'm like, no, I'm uh, like you guys. And uh, so it was all done in French and it's more like eye level stuff. So I hope it's relevant to you. All right. I'm really, really touched by those invitations that I got uh, to come here in Barcelona or anywhere else in the, in the world. I, like each time it's like, but, but why? why? Why don't you, you know, if you want to listen to what I have to say, just play my games. But uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm touched to be, uh, to be here in front of you. Uh, I'm not a Ubisoft anymore, so I, I didn't have any, uh, a lot of archive you know, with me and, and say, oh, this is how we did it, this is an Excel sheet, and uh, this is a, a drawing. I have, have, have nothing, okay? So I'm sorry for that, so, but there's internet, and, uh, you can, and so uh, I found some images. I, I'm not a theorist, I'm not a scholar of games, I don't do those, time of, uh, those kind of talks very often. Uh, I, I make games. Yeah. In my, uh, with, you know, in, in a studio, in, uh, in an office, uh, with, with, with people. So, uh, I, I Actually, I don't believe that I know how to make games. It's true. I only have my experience to share. And really, I, I don't know how to do video games. I do my stuff. I was about to say shit. I do my... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, and, but because uh, when you start a game, it's, it's all about what you want to achieve and uh, accomplish and not about, oh, what is a video game? I'm, I'm not in, in that at all. Okay, so this is all before we start. Uh, today, I will not talk about free-to-play monetization and, and, and stuff like that. <laughs> Sorry. That's, a, that's my, little, uh, my little punch on the, the guys from yesterday. Uh, no, they said I was, I was dying, so anyway. Uh, and I will not comment about my current situation for the people who know a little bit what's going on in my life. Everything is on the web, but I'll do it a little bit. <laughs> Okay, so who, who am I? I'm an unemployed game designer right now. Uh, I did uh, eight, eight games, uh, mostly Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, Assassin's Creed Saga, so the first one, the second one, and Brotherhood, and this game that uh, I hope eventually you'll be able to play called 1666 Amsterdam. Uh, I am Ubisoft, or I was, because I am not anymore. Uh, I was Ubisoft Montreal, very first uh, production employee. Uh, when they arrived in Montreal in 97, I said I'm the first one because I was so eager to start working that I arrived the first at like 7.30 in the morning. Uh, and I was the first guy there ready. I say production also because there was like two other people more into, uh, you know, making sure that they would hire people like me and I they would be ready to pay me. But uh, at, at 7.30 I was ready and it was the earliest I never, you know, came to work. After that, it was more around nine. All right, but so, uh, and uh, the very first day of Ubisoft Montreal, uh, we were 10 guys. And guys, there was no girls uh, at the first day. <laughs> uh, and then uh, today, uh, Ubisoft Montreal is around 3,000 people. Yeah, <whistles> good. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's different from here to there, so I'm not sure if, uh, what you see. Uh, uh, I say I'm a big time creative director, so it's a bit, uh, this is what I do in general uh, with my teams. Uh, they're so big, so it's a, it's a bit uh, having an auditorium, and uh, this is what I do. Being a creative director is to uh, take people in mind and, and, and a team and, and push them forward, so this is what I do most of the time. 
Uh, I'm still learning to have, uh, trying to be a producer in, in all of this because uh, the producer is in fact uh, really the one in charge of, uh, of the budget and the budget is a bit uh, in charge of the game. So uh, I'm learning to be a producer. Uh, I'm not enough uh, a dad. Uh, I don't look like that, but I'm about to turn 40 and uh, I'm a dad of two little girls and I'm often uh, uh, traveling. And, uh, but I, I do my best to also uh, be at, at home. Uh, fundamentally, I believe that I'm an entertainer and that you all are if you do video games. Uh, <clears throat> we are in the entertainment business uh, and art. Uh, when people play a game, it's, uh, they, it's, it's a choice they make. They could have read a book, uh, see a movie, uh, watch an HBO uh, TV show. Uh, yeah, it's true. And they say, oh, no, let's, let, let's play a game. And so because they want to be entertained. But, and you are entertainers. Uh, we're part of the show business, guys, okay? But really, really, I'm just a dude making games with friends. This is roughly, yeah, but it's true. It's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, I'm, I get paid to, not these days, but I get, I get mo mostly paid to, to go uh, with friends and, and create and, and, and have fun. So it's, but, and I'm just, a, really, I'm just a dude, okay? The, like, like in the movie a little bit. But uh, <coughs> where, where do I come from? And, and I feel like this is the, the most important question because where you come from, you can then put it in, 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 your, in your art, in your, in your design, and in your product. So I come from a little town called Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu in Quebec. I'm, uh, I'm Quebecois, I'm French-speaking. This is the town. Uh, they have a hot hair balloon festival. It's really, really big. R really, like the 175 hot hair balloons and... But uh, I left, uh, I now live in Montreal, and that's really just my hometown. Uh, for sure, we play hockey, ice hockey. It's, it's really cold during winter, but it's really, really hot during summer. It's true. And, uh, and, uh, and this is me when I was 17, with, with my brother. Okay? And uh, actually, yeah I, I, yeah, I did it. Okay. I really look really, really dumb. Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, also, I come from a father. But uh, no, I, can't, I should have put mother in f uh, first. So I come, uh, my, fa my father is a retired math teacher, so it's the logic of in, in my brain. And he became a school director, and now he's helping uh, uh, with uh, like international cooperation. Yeah, and he's a survivor of the 80 earthquake in 2010. Uh, uh, and please, yeah, no phone. Uh, yeah, he's a survivor of the 80 earthquake. It, it's amazing. He was there, the... the the hotel fell into, it, into his head and, and he survived. And uh, so I still have my father, so uh, I don't believe in God, but thank God. Uh, my mother was an historian and a psychosociologist. I don't know if it exists in English, but this is what she is. And she's now uh, the uh, International uh, Secretary of International Adoption of Quebec. So every single little kids that are uh, adopted in Quebec, my mother signs the paper. Eh? It's true. It's like, uh, and she travels around. She does the uh, uh, talk like uh, like I just do. I went in public schools. I never been to private. Uh, never. Play. So I'm a, I'm a product of uh, public uh, school, and I'm really proud of it uh, somehow. I did a test when I was like uh, 12 to go in a private school, and they said yes, you can come. And I don't know. I was already a rebel, and I said no. <laughs> okay. Uh, I. I did literature in Cégep. Uh, Cégep is something that only exists in, uh, in Quebec, not even in Canada. Cégep is Collège d'enseignement général et professionnel. What it means is that before going to university, you can do, well, you have to do two years as a general uh, course with uh, some uh, specialty. Like me, it was literature and uh, cinema and, and theater. Or you can try to learn a craft and it's three years and then you become like a, a uh, helper of a dentist or, or you know, oculist and, uh, and whatnot. So sometimes it's good for people who don't want to go to schools too long. They just want to know a, and to have a job quick. So you do three years. And if you want to continue to university. And so that's a CEGEP. I really like this uh, formula, by the way. Uh, I went to Université de Montréal in uh, movie studies. Like, and uh, I, uh, I did two years. Uh, it was a major. And then I had to do a, a minor in something else. And then Ubisoft arrived. And uh, never did. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a dropout. I did a lot of improvisation and acting. Uh, I would like, yeah, for like, I don't know, five years I thought, oh, maybe I could be an actor. And then I realized that I was not that good. It's true. There's like to be an actor, you need to have like this special thing inside of you. 
and then you become like something else and I was not I, w I prefer to be behind the scenes and, and create the the plays and write them and and so that's why I picked video games in the end all right uh, also just like that I didn't I uh, wasn't sure if I would say that but I lived uh, two years in Rwanda as uh, when I was really a, a, a kid and uh, and my father was a math teacher in the University of uh, Rwanda and uh, two year and one year in uh, in Naples uh, Napoli uh, some people will make the joke uh, that I spent three years in Africa uh, but uh, okay I won't I won't do it <coughs> Eh sì, parlo italiano pure. Allora, oh, but uh, not, not really good at it. Uh, so, and video games is part of my life since I'm six years old. Since my, again, my dad was a math teacher. Uh, he was in charge of uh, the mathematical uh, department of CEGEP. And so we had the new technology every time. I, re I remember he came home one day with a, you know, a calculator uh, and it was that big. And he, he said, oh, we just bought that for all the, the math teachers in, in CEGEP, and uh, it cost us $600. And, uh, and, and you know what it does? It does percentage. You can and press one button, and, and now it's crazy. You look on your iPhone, and you have the calculator, and you flip it, and it goes from a normal one to... So anyway, I remember that. So I had an Apple II, and this is Choplifter on Apple II, and this is Load Runner on Apple II. This is how I started. I, my very first level that I did, I was six years old, and I did a, a uh, oh, with the, with the light is bad, but uh, I did a Load Runner level where you, there was a little character and you had to, uh, probably you know, and, and I guess my ego was already big at six years old. Uh, my first level was Pat, written, and uh, so Pat being my Patrice uh, small, short. Okay, 15 minutes, I gotta go faster. I never, ever, ever thought I would do video games as a, for, for a living, ever. It didn't exist uh, when I studied in the, uh, in, in the beginning of the 90s. It was not a dream. It was not a, a plan to have, oh, you'll be a game designer, you'll make video games. Until Ubisoft arrived really in 97, there was no real uh, business uh, in Montreal about it. So uh, that's why it's really surreal for me to be here and talk about it in front of you in Barcelona. What is it? Uh, life is strange, uh, <laughs> but uh, but it's true. I'm I'm here and uh, that it, it's real. Uh, by the way, in Montreal now, the industry, it's been like 15 years. Is uh, 8,000 people are working in video games in Montreal. In '97, maybe there was like 50. So this like it's because uh, a guy had an idea, and he tricked everyone into his idea. His name was uh, Mr. Vaujois, and he he went to Paris. He met with Ubisoft the people and he said, I had a great deal with the Quebec government about tax credit. And he got, oh, interesting, interesting, good. He came back to Quebec and then he went to see the government. <laughs> and he said, I have this great deal with Ubisoft. <laughs> oh, that's good, good, good. And then he made the deal. <laughs> but he had no deal at first. Okay, uh, but enough about me. Uh, le 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 let's start already, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I like to talk about myself because this is what I transposed then into my game. So the very first game I did, go hype the time quest with the Playmobil license. That was weird. I, I, I got the hired. I was a bit lucky. Uh, was I really again I wanted the the job? Uh, I sent my uh, resume uh, <coughs> to Ubisoft Paris because my mom was working in the government. She knew about the deal that was not a deal yet, da, 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 da. and I, I was lucky enough to get the address, so I sent my resume. My very first email that I sent was my you know, resume to Ubisoft, and then they called me, and I missed the phone, and I said, oh, and then I called back, and the guy, Alain Tascan, could not reach, the, reach him, and then eventually I get someone who says, well, he's not here anymore. So I said, okay, where, where is he? I need to talk with the, with the dude. Uh, he said, uh, they said, we don't know. You don't know where he left? Nope. So what I did, I, I took the yellow pages, the, you know, at the time. Uh, you don't go to Google uh, back then to get a phone number. So I take the, the big phone, uh, the big phone book, and I went into all the hotels. Because, I knew he's, you know, he's French, so he's somewhere in Montreal in an hotel room. So, and I went from, you know, A, B, C, and he was at the Sheraton. So, <laughs> yeah. 
And I, I hate phones, by the way. It's, it's a bit my phobia, uh, phones, so, uh, but I did it. And anyway, so I called him, I lef, uh, left him a, a message. Uh, then I wrote another letter. I went to, <laughs> to the hotel. I said, I, I actually want to work uh, for, for you guys. And, uh, and eventually, uh, he didn't feel like I was too crazy. Uh, then he called me back. I uh, had a good interview. And in the interview, he asked me, OK, what do you want to do? Well, I, I, I said I was a scriptwriter. I, I lied a bit. Uh, I was writing script with my friends on the weekends. Um, and he said, do you want to do an interview about script writing? He said, I, I don't know. Do you want to do an interview about game design? I said, yes. I never did game design in my life. But I, I said yes, because I said, you know, script writing, I could do it for TV, for movies. And, but game design, it's only for you. So let's do the interview about game design. And the night before, I read all my next generation magazines. So I knew terms like gameplay. And I felt really intelligent. I was 22 years old, and they hired me. And the first game <laughs> I did was this one. And in one morning, you know, I said, OK, you got the job. Here's a Playmobil character. You have a week. You start in a week, and you'll design the game. My problem is that I never actually played with Playmobil. I'm a Lego guy. So. <laughs> I was 22, uh, you know, living bohemian life, uh, having fun with friends, and then suddenly I had a Playmobil in my hand, and I had to design a game which I never did in my life. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, we did it in 97, 99, uh, so two years. Nobody knew how to make a video game in the, uh, in, in the office. Ooh, I'm good there. OK. Uh, so everybody came in. They were uh, all young at me. Nobody did a video game before. The engineers, the artists, and so we first thing we learn is to, OK, who the hell are you? <laughs> what do you do? And, and it's like, oh, OK, an engineer is this. Like, the engineer it's, it tried to explain to me you know, how to code. Uh, the other guy how to animate. And me, I'm like, OK, but uh, I need to design guy. I need to come up with uh, some ideas and, 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 and a story. And, and this is what I think I, uh, I must do. Uh, and, and then we realize that, no, OK, what we do is like, we ain't actually, we're not, we do not work in silos. We, we work together all the time. And uh, so the very first thing we learn is like, OK, this is what you do. This is what I do. How the hell do we work together? It, how those crafts interact with each other? I learned a bit the computer logic. And it's important to get it. It's like just this idea of like, OK, you propose something, if, uh, and then, and then end. And just this logic for a designer is really important. At least you understand the logic of the guy who's actually making the, 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 the really tough part of a game, which is code. Art is, is second, design is third. It's really, it's easy. Us, we have the easy life. And I'm not even talking about the producer who actually don't do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I want to become one, by the way. Uh, all right, I learned also the, in my craft and more design, the, the, the intricate and, and dialogue there exists between design and script writing. I remember my, with my script writer, because when you write a, a movie, the script, you know, when you write the script, nobody actually bothers you, right? You just write it, everything's fine. But as you do design and script, it, it has to come together. And I remember having discussion with my script writer, say, oh, no, it's my part. I should be writing this. He said, no, it's the design, no, it's the script. And then eventually say, oh, OK, maybe it's really half and half all the time. And so it's one thing that I learned, it's that really you should always have a dialogue between the script and the design. And then something that I've, I, I'm going to reuse for the rest of my career, I guess, is this, this pleasure, this fun to have between you know, using time as a, background, uh, a backbone sorry, of the game structure. Uh, I'm the Time Quest is a game about a little guy jumping around with a sword, which is the only game I did, really. Uh, you'll see at the end with the video, it's like, oh, fuck. Uh, <clears throat> but in this game, you had four time period. And uh, it was the story of a, uh, the hype. That was his name. Uh, by the way, I just write that in one brain, personal brainstorm. Uh, maybe we could have a character named Hype. And uh, it will, there would be a love uh, story. And it would be Hype and Love. And Hype, Love got away. And Hype remained. But uh, so it was the story of a guy you know, pulled back in the past. And he wakes up in, uh, in the era of Tascan I, the, 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 the king. And he had to come back to Tascan IV. And uh, you would play. Uh, between the, uh, the different time period. And so time is really something that is fun to play with. And then I did Sense of Time, Allah, and then Assassin. So time is really important for me. So my takeaway during that period is games are a dialogue with someone, sorry, the player, and not a monologue. In, 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 different, in other art, 
guy coming from movie and, and theater, you have a monologue. Uh, you, you say something, and the audience cannot answer back, right? So uh, yeah, I, now you can go on Twitter say uh, the movie was uh, was shit, but it will not change the end product. In a game, it's all about uh, having a dialogue because as soon as you give a pad into the hands of someone, he's the co-creator of the experiences, and if he wants his experience to be a guy turning around like this forever, well, that's his game, and there's nothing you can do about it except knowing in advance and be okay with it. Okay, so this, that was my first thing that actually I learned is like game are a dialogue and not a monologue. Then uh, I went into a break, the very, my very first break uh, from game, still in the office, but I became the game design studio manager. I guess it's because I was the you know, oldest guy there, and uh, so I managed the team of game design. I, what I did there, we read a lot of articles and, and, and we discussed a lot about game design. I hired a bunch of people. And, and we created that game design studio and, and we learned. This is where I basically, that, that nine months I spent as a game design manager, uh, I, I learned how to, to make games a little bit better. And I realized that I actually didn't like the office space type of work that games brings. That, uh, oh, there's HR, you have to be there on time, and there's all the politics, and I, I, which I hate, by the way till this day. But this is when I actually realized that, no, what I want to do is just create those games and not work in an office. And this is the, <laughs> this is the very first 100 employees of Ubisoft Montreal. I'm not the guy in, uh, with the circle red. I'm the blue guy in the back. It's just that I found this, uh, I found this picture on, uh, on Facebook, and the guy in red was the guy having the picture. Uh, his name is uh, Frédéric Brassard, and now he's the CEO of 3Pod uh, Agency, and he's uh, bringing talents to Montreal. It's cool. Okay, so after that, they say, well, you know what, uh, you should be designing game. And I said, yes, and they, you know, they gave me a licensed game. So my second one is Donald Duck Going Quackers, which we did in 99 and 2001. Uh, it was a PS2 launch title. We, we made it, and the team was around 30 people. Uh, what I learned there is the importance of, of the pre-production phase. Why? Because we had the game running, the entire game design and level design, first on Excel sheet, which is kind of weird, but we knew what we wanted to do with all the uh, uh, enemies and obstacles, and we've put that into an Excel sheet to have the rhythm, and eventually we did the game with Rayman as the main character, and we've put the, the, the enemies were blocks going into their behaviors, and we had the entire level design, the entire game, like in six months. And then we were just waiting for the engine to run on a PS2, and then we made the switch uh, with Donald Duck, and, uh, and, and we were ready to ship, except PS2 uh, was not ready, really. Uh, what I learned there is the importance of rhythm when you play. Uh, you can play Donald Duck without touching the ground. You can go from enemies to enemies to enemies to enemies, and, uh, and, and that, that importance and that pleasure of, of, of playing with the uh, rhythm. It, it's my first and last try to copycat another game. Uh, Mark is the guy, uh, Mark Cerny will follow me here, and, uh, and I, we totally copycat and, and, and stolen from Crash Bandicoot. It's the same game, roughly. Uh, my producer wanted a, jump and, uh, a run and jump game. That was my mandate that I received. I say, okay, uh, can we fight? No, it's a run and jump game. Uh, okay, can I have special? No, it's a run and jump game. And, uh, and eventually I, I, I did it anyway. There's special moves in uh, Donald Duck. It's also a copycat of uh, the Mario, Bro, uh, Mario Brothers system of going uh, smaller, big. Uh, uh, this time around, though, it's the, all about the emotion of Donald Duck. And uh, so, yeah, th this, this game is, is totally like I, I stole it from uh, everywhere. But uh, so I never did it be, uh, after that. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, I learned also that do not go crazy with new technology. There was a, there was a, you know, it's like it's PS2. There's, we got so many polygons. Uh, it's going to be amazing. So, <laughs> uh, small anecdotes. There was a modeler who did a, a a trash can inside one of the levels, and uh, the, the 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 thing had like. 20,000 polygons in the background that you saw so, so little of it. But he said, well, I got, I got polygons. 
He said, no, you don't. Like, uh, so you have to be intelligent and don't go crazy with new technology. Uh, next gen is, uh, is coming, and uh, so yeah, don't go crazy with it. Always use it the best way possible. And then uh, I learned that communication is, is, is key in a, in, a, in a video game production. I would do every uh, day, I would do a, a report to the team about what would, uh, went well and uh, didn't. And I would do it at the end of production every day, at, before that every week. Uh, this is where I learned that yeah, as, as a game designer, now creative director, what you do mostly is you communicate some ideas and you communicate also the key issues with the other ones, other people, and you're the central point. You're kind of like la pierre angulaire. I don't know how to say that in, uh, in English, but you're that, that, that thing in the middle of it all and you need to communicate and you cannot keep it, all those ideas and, and, and uh, thoughts for yourself. Okay, my takeaway of this, difficulty should be on the screen and not on the pad, ever. Uh, you know, me combos and oh, it's tough, I don't get it. No, you should, this should be really easy to do. And then on the screen, this is where you must be intelligent and not, ah, I'm good with my tongues. You have to be good with your brain. And this is where I learned it's true, this game. And I'm gonna use that later on. My third one, a game that you never actually played or heard about it was a Rainbow Six Flash game that we did in a week. <laughs> With three guys, uh, I actually, uh, I, we only did the conception, everything was done on paper, it was kind of like a board game that worked also uh, in a computer, so another team took it, another three guys, and they did it. Uh, so I did only the conception for that. Do it quick, with do it well. It was uh, amazing, like, just like, okay, we have a week to design a game, let's do it, and it was, it was really great, and that is my takeaway, is that trust yourself, because your first idea is, all, is, is often the best one. You can come back and uh, work on it, but you know this first flash when you make a connection, it's probably you know when you connect the dots, it's probably probably the good one. Okay, fourth game, uh, another one that I did only the conception of is uh, Rainbow Six Three. Uh, Raven Chill, it became. Uh, I'm not a shooter guy, really. I, I do play uh, shooters, right? I love the very first Rainbow Six. I had an epiphany playing that game at, uh, at the office on a Sunday afternoon with everyone and everyone was screaming and, uh, and uh, yeah, you got me in the head. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I'm not really a, a shooter guy. But what I learned there is that I did a, my very first blueprint session. It's something I do with every game now. Is that I, s I sit down in a room with uh, uh, the scriptwriter, the art director, a tech guy and, uh, and other designers and we actually build the game together. And we play the game in our head and with uh, boards and that from beginning to end. So, okay, that's the first level. Where are we? What do we do? And, uh, and so the very first time I did that was with Rainbow Six uh, uh, 3. And <clears throat> since I'm not a shooter guy, I tried to incorporate in Rainbow Six like things I did with Donald Duck. <laughs> Something like, okay, the shooter back then, it was like, yes, uh, only about shooting. Okay, can we go on crates? Can we, can we jump on, on top of stuff? Could we open doors differently? And I think the opening door is the only idea they kept from it, where in Rainbow Six Three you can do it gently instead of just, yes, I open a door. But I wanted to, 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 to put some uh, convention from a third-person action game into a first-person. And I did that uh, later on with other games. My takeaway, bring everyone on the design table and not be only, oh, no, we're the designers, we know. Okay? That was my takeaway of this game. Then I have another interlude. I would put on a shelf for two months because uh, they said, oh, no, but, you know, maybe you're not really a shooter guy. You should, uh, we should, you know, put you on a Rayman project that we would like to do in Montreal. Then, I uh, don't know if Michel is here, said, hey, Michel, he's not sure if he wants to bring uh, Rayman to Montreal. So I was left without any project. And then I went to see a presentation. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going too fast. But uh, when you don't do anything in a video game studio, you go crazy and you want to. So it's really good to be on the shelf sometimes. And I really actually realized that I don't like office space stuff and that I am a game maker. I love that thing that comes out at the end of those years of uh, hard work or, or months. And I went to see a little presentation on a game that we just bought from a team that worked like a month on it called Prince of Persia. And that's my fifth game, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. That's the first game I was a creative director. They opened this thing 
called our creative director while I was on it. Oh, I'm good. Uh, so 2001, 2003, roughly 50 talents on this team. We did it on PS2, GameCube, Xbox, and PC. And uh, the importance of movement. This is what I learned during that, uh, that game. Uh, many things, but uh, this important like uh, of, of having a character that is believable in what he, in what he does on, on the screen. That you actually relate to this, like, oh, yeah, he's probably a really, really amazing athlete, right? And, and that thing being believable was one of the keywords we used during uh, the production. But in 3D, please do always avoid the precision in, in, in movement and precision of, of, uh, of gameplay. So it's not about, you know, in 2D, it's perfect. You try to be really on the edge and it's all about, uh, not, uh, in 3D, you try to, you know, forget that. And that is one of the reasons why uh, the prince jumps automatically and you don't have to actually be precise while jumping. And uh, because we try and said it, it, it's not fun. Control scheme. Uh, it took a while before we actually nailed the control scheme of Sands of Time. And uh, because there was the different uh, things to do. And eventually, like I said, okay, I got it. I woke up in the morning. I said, I think I got the control scheme. Uh, we have to <coughs> link what the character does in his length to what you actually press also on the, on the pad. So it seems like, okay, what, what do you actually mean by that? It seems weird. Is that in the game, any action that are long for the print, like walking on the wall, so that we call it the walling, or drinking water, was done by the same key. And it was the only key that you had to press and hold, which was uh, R1, if I remember correctly. Everything else, it was, it was pushed because it was quick action. It was the same thing. So because at first, okay, how do we make it in, uh, run on walls and drink water? Right? And, it's like, and it was this idea of like putting the same uh, uh, to, to, for the player to be a bit doing the same thing as, as the main character. All right. And then it was this thing, hide the design. You, the player should never see the design. So sense of time, it, everything, and I, I went crazy and I'm still like that. It's all about justification of every single design elements. So what is the story of sense of time? Is a guy in a, in a palace with holes and, and, uh, you know, and, and spikes, and he's got a, a, a dagger with the rewind uh, button and, and function, but it all makes sense in the universe of the prince. So, for example, the booby trap system is something you as a player open up, and that is why there's booby traps. It's not because, oh, there's booby traps. And, uh, and the pole in two, you will like go around the poles, are poles for a flag. And, not, and just before that, it seems like normal these days, but just before that, Crash Bandicoot and, and Mario and other games, you could see the pole, and it was yellow and written, and with, like, this is where you must go. And now it was, no, let's hide that design. And, and, and like that, people will get it and say, oh, it's fe it feels natural. So I designed Dimit. And it was a bit the beginning, again, of organic design that I'm going to reuse with, uh, uh, pr uh, with Assassin's Creed. And uh, firefighting. This is roughly what also a, a designer is. It's funny because we start a fire with a vision, with an idea, and then we firefight it to make it a reality. And the rewind... Uh, uh, idea is all about that. It was difficult to run on walls and not dying. It was great, it was fun, but you were always responding. I said, that's boring. So why not have this thing that we have on our remote control called a rewind. So instead of like stopping and responding, we just go back and restart. And that made sense of time. And it's just that idea of like, okay, we have a problem, we die too often, instead of making the difficulty uh, uh, lower, we invented the rewind function, and without the rewind, which is funny, I don't think Prince of Persia would have been that successful, and for sure that the, the title would have been different. Hey. My takeaway, yes, it's more afterward. Because when we uh, after that game, uh, my my life changed a, a little bit. Uh, we received, uh, I think, uh, around 35 awards. We sold uh, roughly five to six million copies. And then I, I went and, and people say, whoa, it's, it's amazing what you did. I said, oh, really? Uh, okay, yeah, y you changed my life. Said, oh, yeah, what, what do you mean? I, I remember being in Cincinnati in a focus group 
And the guy just, he said, I just finished Sands of Time. He didn't see me, right? There was this glass and I was eating M&Ms and he was like talking about his experience. He said, oh, last night I finished uh, Sands of Time and it, it, it really changed my life. Uh, and the guy said, okay, wh why? Uh, because before that, I didn't know what beauty was. And now I kind of know. And I'm like, whoa, okay. It's a, uh, okay, we actually have an impact on people's life. Video games is done, you know, something uh, alone in your... Uh, in your basement, living room, or, or, or on your phone and, and whatnot, and we don't think that it's a cultural thing and, and that, no, but we change people's behavior and mind. And uh, so we got a lot of power. And so let's use it with intelligence and efficiency and, and some, uh, yes, uh, so if, if foreseeing. Uh, so that's what I, I learned at the end of, of, of Sands of Time. Then I turned 30. So uh, yeah, I finished Sands of Time, I was 29. I turned 30, and you, you'll see it, it's the big one. Don't, uh, don't stress. Uh, and I said, okay, will I do video games for the rest of my life? That was really my question. You know, coming from movies, ah, oh, movie is more important. We're doing entertainment, it's about little guys jumping around. Will I actually do it? And that was my big thing. I said, okay, and then I saw maybe the guy from Cincinnati and that changed my mind, but no. I said, but I'm the guy with the mic. I got a mic now, I got a, people are listening to what I say, and I could try to change the world doing uh, Greenpeace stuff, but who cares? When you can, uh, you, you can talk to five uh, million people, so do something intelligent with it, really, and, and try to change even more the people's life, and, uh, and this is when I come up with Assassin's Creed. Uh, and uh, Assassin's Creed is, is a special game for me, but uh, for a lot of people, and there's, this, like, there's many layers and it's all about me turning 30 and trying to make something special and relevant and uh, uh, for, for the entire community. Uh, so a bit uh, for, for my grandmother, I guess. So it took us four years to, to, to build Assassin's Creed 1. Uh, a team, uh, so on, we did it on PS3, uh, 360 and PC, and the team now exploded from 60 to 200. And uh, it took us four years because uh, the first two years was all about uh, building technology. Uh, I'm going into a bit the, the, the story behind it. But uh, so for the first two years, we had nothing to play. We didn't have any uh, engine. We wrote the first line of code and it took a while before uh, we could actually play. But this, the idea was like, oh, the mandate I receive, it's a little mandate, by the way, it was like, try to redefine the action adventure genre on the next gen platform. And, uh, you know, just, just try to redefine it. Okay. Right? Uh, and it was a Prince of Persia uh, title at first. So it was Prince of Persia Next Generation. And I had a problem with the prince as the main character. Uh, because I just did one. And a prince is somebody who doesn't do a lot. A prince is a guy who's waiting for the dad to die to take his place. Uh, and he goes around and he does like that. Uh, I know uh, I'm in the Commonwealth in Canada and we have a prince like that and he goes around. and. Uh, I don't, uh, is there a, yeah, there is a, yeah, you have one too. Uh, they go like that. So, and you cannot make a game about the guy. Uh, but uh, a prince is the number two of an organization called a kingdom. So you just have to change the organization and you put the number two of this new organization and he does something more than this. And my organization, I remember a book I read about secret society while I was in university. And the very first chapter of, of that book about secret society, they talked about the Ashashin and the myth of the old man of the mountain. I said, well, that's great. Why not? You know, it's still in Persia, so it's Prince of Persia. And why not make the guy the number two of that Ashashin organization? And then you'll be the Prince of Persia assassin. And then it took two years before Ubisoft actually realized it was better to play an assassin than a prince. I had to, to, to sell it. Come on, we don't need the prince anymore. Come on, you, you got an assassin. Why do you need a prince for it? It's the license and the... No, no, no. And then eventually they, they woke up. It's all about organic design. Uh, <clears throat> the idea is that let's try to have GTA, open world, but instead of having cars, it's a guy. And a guy does a lot of things. But everything you'll see on the screen, you'll understand it and you can actually uh, use what you know as a human being and transpose it into the main character and then you don't have to learn about the rule set and you'll, you'll play. The very best example of that is the climbing. The climbing system, before that, you, 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 know, you would looking for the texture, right? 
the big like uh, vine texture and you say, okay, this is where I can climb. In AC, you can climb anywhere because the rule set is about having something sticks out of a wall of 10 cent centimeters and the character will stick and so that's why you can go everywhere. And uh, so it's my second attempt about organic design. I think it went pretty well. Yeah, I, this is my favorite uh, image of Assassin's Creed 1. I got it at home, a uh, big, uh, big one. Again, we went way too crazy with technology. It was next gen. So we spent so much time building AI, like really intelligent AI. And if I, I guess I, after three years, I said to the team, like, look, guys, it, it's cool your, your, your bots that uh, are really, really intelligent, but they're not. They're not that intelligent. First, secondly, I don't understand a hell, you know, AF. Uh, about what's going on. We need, we need rules. We need to understand what's going on. And so it's not about technology for technology's sake. Sometimes you say, okay, enough. I don't need the guy who thinks so much as an AI. I need a guy who does this behavior because then the player will be able to do something with it. So stop about doing technology. So, uh, but at the end, they had a really good engine and uh, that's why they can uh, ship uh, an Assassin's Creed ev every year now. Yes. Uh, uh, the fantasy is the real reason why we play. It's to go somewhere else. Uh, I learned it there. Uh, me, my fantasy it was to jump on really high places. I've got vertigo in life, a really big time. I cannot go in high places. And I did a game where you can jump from really high tower. Uh, that was my fantasy. And I guess uh, it depends on, on you guys what your fantasy is in, the, in Assassin's Creed. A lot of you, I guess, it's about killing people. You could go see uh, doctors for that, but uh, <laughs> I think it's really, really the fantasy is what people actually uh, pick. That's the reason why they play one game or the other. What is the fantasy? Yes, that's my fantasy. Open world it was a big challenge and a big difference from Sands of Time where it's a corridor. Open world are great, but they are uh, really challenging to make because uh, the dialogue with the player is even greater than before. Uh, you can even change the language, if you, you know? So it's like, oh, I don't understand what you're saying. Uh, so a mission, for example, in, in, uh, in AC, you could start and finish the mission from any angle possible. So imagine doing level design for that. You don't know where the, the player will come from. So it's really, really difficult to put all your, your uh, ingredients at the, at the good time. But it's at the same time amazing. It's tough when you did one to go back to be to do a, a linear game. Okay, I'm good. I got 15 minutes. Woohoo! All right. Uh, don't follow the rules. You can always do better. Again, I was asked to do a Prince of Persia game, and I did an Assassin's Creed game. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll go fast now. My takeaway for this: ship it. Because we we get to continue, 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 and eventually, uh, yeah, ship it. And uh, it's not perfect. Uh, I wanted to have a lot more than only nine guys to kill, uh, nine missions. Uh, we, we had a, a lot of uh, submission uh, on the side, subquests. Uh, we had uh, so much more than uh, we actually shipped, but we had to ship it. So uh, I'm sorry if you felt like the first game was not a finished product. And, uh, and please, please uh, stop telling me it was repetitive. I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> FIFA is really, really repetitive also, so has a lot of games out there, and I don't think it was that repetitive. Anyway, uh, okay, I said it, it's on TV, uh, I'm good for the rest of my life. And I'm sorry about the flags. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not really that sorry, I, I wanted that. The second game, <laughs> my seventh game was Assassin's Creed 2. Uh, now it took like two years. We had the technology, we knew our game was all about trying to nail it down even better, but now the, even the game grew even bigger. 3,000, three continents, there was always someone working on Assassin's Creed 2 from all over the place, 24 hours, 7. The pure joy of going back at it. It was the very first time that I, I, I came back to a, a second time around, and I, and I really actually loved it because then you had your ingredients. You knew what, what you could play and, and, and create, and I wanted to have a family story this time around, and I put everything that I could in the first one and the second one. Uh, and it was all about reading the playground, a lot better than the first game. So the first game is all about individual going around, and in the second one we said, no, let's do groups of people. So you can say, okay, there's a group there, there's a group there. And then you can read the crowd much better than having only, uh, like, uh, or not only, but to have 120 NPCs and you're trying to read them. Reading the playground, all right. Uh, the importance of really having, and this is where I, I did it the best I feel, about the progression of 
what you're teaching the player and what you're telling the player. So Ezio, quite contrary to uh, Altair, Ezio is a guy learning to become an assassin, just like you as a player, you're learning to become an assassin. It's so much easier than Altair is already a freaking master and he has nothing to learn. And it's, okay, how the hell do I learn? I teach the player now that the guy is, anyway. So this one, it's really much more connected and it worked way better. Then I learned a tease, learn, practice, master uh, structure inside a level or in, uh, inside the narrative. So at first you tease something. So when one of the example I can give here is that the very first time you see someone do a leap while they climb, it's, it's an NPC who does that. Then you will learn it. Somebody will, will teach, you, teach you. Then you have to practice in one mission and at the end there's always the boss. And uh, so the structure of all the mission structure on AC2 is about tease, learn, practice, master all the time. Okay. My takeaway, don't be so serious. The first game was like, oh, serious. And the second game, I, I, we made this amazing joke, I feel, where Ezio meets for the first time his uncle Mario, uh, or it's been a while, and uh, his uncle, and he said, hello, Ezio. And Ezio said, uh, you know, do you know me? And then his uncle Mario says, but it's me, Mario. And in this like vengeance story, we had this smile moment and throughout the game it was a smile and it's like important. Even though we do epic game, don't be so serious. So it's a me, Mario. You know, we had problem. Nintendo called us and said, what are, what are you doing? And you're not supposed to. Hey, come on. It was just a fight. And it's funny and I love you guys. My <laughs> eighth game was Assassin's Creed Brotherhood 2009, 2009. Oh, I think I made a mistake. But uh, no, because I, 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 no, it was 2009 and roughly I didn't finish. I did all the conception, all the recordings, and, uh, and then I, 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 I left. It was the same uh, size uh, team. It was all really just mise en scène. I don't know how to, uh, to say it in English. Just about really just do a narrative, and we had not, you know, 10 months to do it. But it, it was really uh, fun to do. And again, we're having fun with the structure a lot in, uh, in Brotherhood, where you go, like, uh, there's, like, the present, uh, and then there's, there's the story of Ezio, and, in the future, and uh, we, we had a lot of fun with that. And then my takeaway there is that maybe I work too much. Then 13 years straight, I just had a little, uh, my second daughter, she was three days old, and I was in blueprint session doing Brotherhood. And then I said, okay, that's it. I gotta, I gotta do something else. Uh, I, I gotta stop. And so I took a sabbatical year. A bit forced, because I had a non-compete clause back then, but I spent time with my family. Uh, the importance of taking time to think uh, and see your kids grow as a game designer is an amazing thing because you, you can analyze what they do and say, oh, they're, they're learning and say, yeah, they flip around. And anyway, it was an amazing thing. <laughs> so I could read, see, touch, meet, play, and, and, and travel. I, I went to uh, different places. I, I did six weeks road trip in a mini with my family to see the Vikings in, 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 in Newfoundland. Uh, so I had time and it's been like a, 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 an amazing moment. Uh, my takeaway is this picture. I don't know if it's a picture. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you know that picture, but uh, this is your life. Do what you love and do it often. Life is short and share your passion. Okay, so that was my takeaway. And if we put everything together, and now the sound doesn't work for sure, right? Eh? Ah. Same game.
title uh, will continue, okay? Because I got uh, seven minutes just to let the, okay. And now, can I talk about it? <laughs> okay, just a little tease. So my ninth game, it's called 1666 Amsterdam. I'm fighting for it, and that's all I can say for now. <laughs> but hey, you see a picture, I don't know if you know, it's a Rembrandt uh, picture. Uh, but roughly, it's, it's, it's all those, you know, years of experience put together. I am, you know, and it, I'm sorry, guys, it was amazing. And it's still amazing. And uh, eventually, I hope to get it back to finish it for you and for me. And so we all have a, a good time with it. Uh, because, yeah, two years already in it. Okay? But that's it. All right, the future, because they, okay, uh, it's fine, you pass, or that. What, what about the future? It's really tough to predict. Uh, when I started in 97, there was nothing of what's written there. So there was no Google, no iTunes, no tablets, no Xbox Live, PSN, Steam, no Facebook, no Twitter, no free-to-play. Okay, so, and, uh, so uh, where are we going to be in 15 years? Really, I, I don't know. I don't think nobody can actually predict uh, the, the future. You're just, you're just building step by steps. But uh, we are right now at the crossroad in our industry. Uh, because of everything that we, 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 we learned. But I, I don't believe the AAA blockbuster will die. Uh, maybe uh, the way it's dis distributed will change, but they, they won't die. Uh, I think, uh, bec why? Because the, the, there's two things, mostly. There's video games and there's interactive experiences. I do interactive experiences a lot more than video games. It's great to play the little games, I, I, I do play those games also, but there's something else. Sometimes you, you know, and I, yesterday I said to uh, in one of the party, I don't know uh, if the person is here, is like uh, the, the, the little games that makes a lot of money these days uh, are, are like a, a, a magazine. It, it's great, it's like a people magazine. You, you know, you, know you, you, look, uh, you look at the gossips, but after a while it's done. And you don't know who write it, and you don't really care about it. And, and interactive experiences are like novels. It, it's something else. And uh, you go inside it, it takes time, and it, uh, you, you, again, try to change your, your mind a little bit and your life with it. Uh, so that's why you know that who Dan Brown is, and you don't know who wrote The, the Last People magazine. So it, it's, it's all great, but uh, that's the main difference between the two. And eventually, uh, the AAA will make money again. Uh, why? Because eventually, we'll go to the free-to-play, and then you're screwed. Uh, <laughs> Hey, I love you. I, I said that with a smile, okay? There's no, uh, nothing. Uh, uh, but I, I believe, though, that we need a revolution of subject matters. Uh, it's been like four E3s uh, that I go to, and it's always the same thing. I, I get it that we like space marines and shooters, and, and, but eventually, come on. Uh, we need to talk about something else. Um, but, but why are we talking about shooters and, uh, or, or space marines and, and people like that? It's, be, it's still because the medium is, is really into its infancy and it's all about interactivity it, and it's so much easier production-wise or, or code-wise to blow stuff up than create a, 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 an interaction about human beings where it's so more subtle than killing. So eventually we'll get there and it's really a shame that I cannot finish 1666, but it's because it was about all that. Uh, so make games also with a cultural point of view. It's, uh, I believe that, uh, you know, we did a game about uh, the, uh, somehow the Muslim faith. We did a game uh, about Italian Renaissance. Uh, they, did, they did a game about uh, the American Revolution. And I think more and more, you know, having a, a, a cultural point of view will be something uh, important. So uh, somewhere here, in, uh, someone here in Spain should do a game about, about you guys. Uh, I'm working... Uh, not a lot, but uh, there was about something about, about where I come from in the next game I was making. And I think that will change uh, uh, the, the entire industry. It, it's cool fantasy and space, but come on, there's, there's something else out there. And uh, really the future is, uh, and I'll say it, I'll take my stance in, in this, it's digital all the way, baby. Okay? Uh, you know, but come on, disc. I, I get it, guys, you were really, really pissed off. But uh, basically, deep down... Uh, Nobody complains about not having CDs anymore, or, or, and so the future is digital. There's nothing uh, to do about it. Okay, let's finish. <laughs> All right, I'm almost done. Video games are still, uh, is still uh, uh, being invented as we speak. It's amazing. Uh, we don't have Victor Hugo. We don't have uh, Citizen, uh, you know, Arson Wells behind us. Uh, we're, we're there. We're, we're, we're still at the, uh, at the forefront of it all, and it's, so you can invent anything you want. Uh, we are the rock and roll bands of the two, 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 2000s. We are the cool dudes. Uh, 
It's true. Uh, guys, uh, kids and uh, older kids, uh, they love what we do much more than anything else. So, uh, you know, chill out and, uh, and, and rock and roll. Uh, <coughs> Uh, even if uh, we believe we know, there is no rule of making video games or a good one or a success, okay? We listen to each other, take uh, some ideas here and there, and then, and then just like jump and uh, do a leap of faith on, uh, on your side. Uh, again, it's a dialogue and it's not a monologue. I'm almost done, I'm almost done. Let's finish two, really. Like, uh, no, no. Uh, have no plan, be stubborn, do what you love. Be lucky. Uh, this, uh, yeah, it's true. Be lucky. <laughs> I said it to the kids that I that I met. Life, uh, you know, you, you're always on a train station, and there will there'll be a train passing by. Uh, the train will never actually stop. It will just slow down. Jump in it. Whatever it is, jump in it. If you and uh, it will take you places like you have no clue. Like like me here in Barcelona. And and the very last thing I want to say to you, and really it's important, is like nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Okay. Thank you. Merci. Uh, follow me on Twitter. <laughs>